through on the video is also full. No. Liar, liar. No, no. <laughs> no! <laughs> this, they always say if you put Civil War in the program, you're going to have a big turnout. And they said this was a good one for it. So. They put this uh, in, the, in the newspaper? Or how did they publish it? Online? It was on the newspaper. They had a TV thing on it yesterday. <laughs> uh, it it's online. They send out a, a announcements to like, I forgot how many thousand people. You ready? <laughs> Anytime you are, Bob. Welcome to the Island Amendment Department of Archives and History. Uh, my name is Bob Bradley. I'm the uh, curator here at the State Department of Archives and History. Uh, the gentlemen on the stage here are members of the 33rd Alabama Infantry, and I'll tell you a little bit about them, uh, uh, more about them in just a second. Uh, this program, Architreats, is sponsored by the Friends of the Alabama Archives through a grant by the Alabama Humanities Foundation. The program today is the last program in the Year of Alabama Music, which was sponsored by the Department, Alabama Department of Tourism and Travel. This is also the second Civil War program we've done this year. You're coming to the first end of the first year of the Civil War Susquecentennial, which is a fancy way of saying the 150th anniversary. Uh, we also uh, have a Becoming Alabama going on in the near future. We'll be celebrating uh, the 200th anniversary of the Creek World War of 1812 and the 50th anniversary of the events that occurred in Montgomery during the Civil Rights Movement. So we get to celebrate three things. Most of the country just gets to celebrate one. Uh, the men of the 33rd Alabama Infantry um, have been friends of the archives for a long time. Uh, over the past 25 years, they've been responsible for helping to raise over $250,000 to do conservation on our Civil War period flag collection. We have the third largest collection in the world, and because of them and others, uh, we have uh, been able to conserve 19 of those flags. In a couple of years, we hope to open the uh, new Museum of Alabama, and those flags will be displayed on a rotational basis. If it weren't for them, these are the guys that started the Battle of Selma reenactment years ago, where one of the main purposes was to raise money for the flags. We wouldn't be where we are with the Flag Conservation Project. Now, Civil War reenactors, there's a common belief that these guys run around in strange-looking clothes, shoot at each other, and fall dead. <laughs> now, I've been involved with reenacting in one way or another since 1974, and I'm here to tell you that, true. that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's nothing more fun than laying face down on a sunny afternoon in a field of briars, wondering if the guy on the horse knows you're there. <laughs> But they do a whole lot of other things. I talked about the flag conservation program and how they've helped us. They've also helped preserve a very significant part of our history. Uh, the research that goes into the uniforms, the battlefield tactics, the battles, the leaders, and today, the music, I think you will see. The 33rd is the most authentic uh, Civil War unit in the state of Alabama. I'm proud to know them, and I'm proud to be their friend. Daryl, take it well. Yeah.
see my sweet tobacco flower rose of Alabama. Thank y'all. We are what's been called the 33rd Alabama's Campfire Players. We started all this by sitting around the campfire at reenactments playing music, and it's grown from that to, uh, well, we have one CD that we've done, and we're thinking about doing another one, but we, we do this because we love it, because we enjoy it. I hope y'all didn't hear it come here today to hear some musical perfection, because that's not what we do. Uh, we play the songs the way that we think the soldiers might have heard them, the songs that they played, and we have some instruments that are a little more modern than theirs because the, the old ones are, are hard to get and they're fragile. But uh, we try to do things in the manner that they might have done it. And we don't know exactly how they did it, of course, because there aren't any recordings from then. But we kind of think that, you know, we would, we're kind of in the same vein because as I tell folks when I go to talk to different groups, we are these people. They are us and we are them. They lived 150 years ago, but if you take away the technology, they are us. They're our family. They're our ancestors. So I believe they sat around at times, and when they had leisure, they played music and they sung. They listened to it on the march. Music was a, a big influence in the 18th century, in the 19th century, rather. Uh, the soldiers, when they joined, before they joined, they heard music, uh, minstrel shows, uh, sheet music were the popular ways to get music around. But when they joined the army, they were awakened and went to bed by music. They marched to music during the day. Music during uh, maneuvers or even during battle could tell them how to move and which way to go with the drums or the bugle. Uh, like today, music had its, its purposes. It was used to, to shape opinion. It was used to inspire people. Both sides used music heavily in the war in what we would call today propaganda by writing songs with words that were supposed to uh, influence public opinion, supposed to increase people who signed up to fight and to do other things that were the government's aim. But a lot of folks were involved in writing those songs, some of whom were very famous and we'll talk about later on. Our program started today with a little song called Rose of Alabama. And like many songs that were popular during the 1860s, this was a, a minstrel tune. Minstrel shows were extremely popular, other theater productions as well. And they gave the public the opportunity and the access to the music of the time. And just as radio did when, when we were younger and maybe the Internet does today, that was the medium by which folks learned about the popular music. Rose of Alabama was written by S.S. Steele in 1846. It was likely in Boston, as you'll see a lot of those songs were written in the North that were adapted and used in the South. But it was very popular on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. We're going to start out today with a few war songs after this one. The war songs had several versions usually, a northern version and a southern version used to inspire the men, as we talked about. And we're going to start with a song called The Bonnie Blue Flag. This was one of the most popular songs on either side during the war. It is, unlike a lot of the songs you'll hear, a pure southern song. It was written by, for, and in the South. It was a marching song written by a, an Irish-born composer, Mr. Uh, Harry McCarthy, in 1861. It's to the tune of the Irish jaunting car. So it was an old Irish tune, which is something you, another theme you'll see and hear in a lot of the music of this period, music from the old country. Bonnie Blue Flag premiered in Jackson, Mississippi in the spring of 1861, first time it was ever played. Later on that year, the big, first big public performance was in New Orleans at the mustering in of the first Texas volunteer infantry. So the Texans loved this song. But when New Orleans later on fell to the Yankees, the uh, commanding general, Benjamin Beast Butler, arrested the song's publisher, A.E. Blackman, and fined him $500. He ordered that all copies of this song be destroyed, and he levied a fine of $25 for anyone heard singing or whistling this song. $25 is about $500 in today's money. So that was a pretty stiff, pretty stiff penalty, but such was the power of music. Colonel Whaley, will you lead us out? We'll do the first, third, fifth, and seventh verses. We are a band of brothers. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Thank you. The next song we'd like to do for y'all is a song that was written in the North but was adapted for the South. It's called The Battle Cry of Freedom. It was written in 1862 by Mr. George Root as a patriotic song, and it was extremely popular. The publisher had 14 presses going, turning out copies of music to this song and couldn't keep up with demand. It sold over 700,000 copies and was such a popular tune that it was very quickly adapted to, for the Southern use. The Northern version has lines like the Union forever, hurrah boys, hurrah, down with the traitor and up with the star. We're going to do the Southern version. <laughs> Danny? Well, I'll practice my One thing they wouldn't let us do today is uh, something that would make us a lot more comfortable. You see everybody singing from these song sheets up here, and so that way everybody looks at the words and knows that, know they have them. But uh, we're a lot more comfortable sitting around a campfire at night, but they wouldn't let us build a fire today, so we're having to make do the best we can. Dr. Bridges kind of frowned on that, running his hardwood up here for some reason. So uh, A lot of the songs we talked about, or things we've done so far, songs used to inspire people, songs used to, to shape opinion, to move people. A lot of the songs that the men did were just plain fun. Uh, the songs in camp that they got together and did in the evenings when they were at leisure, uh, in winter camp, you wouldn't have seen men carrying a guitar or uh, sometimes not even a fiddle on the march, although I have read about some men who did. But in winter camp, when the men were stationary in one place for a long time, you might see them borrow a guitar, find a banjo, or bring in a banjo player, and they'd sit around the camp at night when they would have time and have leisure, and they would play songs that were popular of the day. And a lot of those songs had absolutely nothing to do with the war. They were just songs that the men loved to sing. And just like those guys, we love to sing some of them too. And one of those songs I believe you'll recognize is still popular today. Uh, it's Goober Pease, boys. Let's look to Goober Pease. This is a traditional old folk song that was popular in the South before the war. And it's about peanuts, which is something we're real familiar with, eat a lot of. Folks ate them during the war, and uh, by the end of the war, some folks said that was what they were subsisting on. I uh, read something not just a couple of days ago, talked about one lady who said they had nothing left but some old peanuts that uh, had come from the, the field that year. But it was very popular with the Southern soldiers during the war. It's uh, published by A.E. Blackman in New Orleans after the war for the first time. It's so popular during the war that the song, a traditional folk song got published after the war. Nobody knew who read it. So Mr. Blackman, that same man we talked about a minute ago, got fined for publishing another song. Uh, published this one and enlisted the composer as Mr. P. Nutt. <laughs> so. All right, let's do Goober Peas. Danny, you want to lead us out? I got it, buddy. Sitting by the road, 
The song, the, the, the line you heard shouted out in there, Hey, Mr. Here's Your Mule, that was a, uh, two stories behind that. One was that the infantry walked all the time, so they were everybody's mule, and so they loved to say that. But uh, the, another story I think is maybe even a little better is that when the sutlers would come by the camp selling things, they'd often bring a mule with their wagon, and they'd tether their mule somewhere to, uh, to rest while they were doing their business, and they were generally charging the, uh, the uh, soldiers too much, so to get back at them, they'd hide their mule. And everywhere the man would go, you'd hear another soldier yell, Hey, mister, here's your mule. And so as you get over there, they'd come from another part of camp. Here's your mule. And they'd generally give him the run around that way. But uh, a slow song. We like to, to talk about the sentiment as well. Uh, both sides uh, on the war, of the war used a song called the Lorena a great deal. It's a really pretty old song. And it's got a, such a, a beautiful story to it. I didn't want to leave it out. We're going, we're going to ask Jeff Black to sing this song for us. We're kind of putting him on the spot as I'm doing a little solo. But this was a song written in 1856 by Mr. Henry Webster after a broken engagement to Miss Ella Blackson in Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, Webster was pastor at Ella's church there in Zanesville, and they fell in love. Uh, she was, the, unfortunately, though, the ward of a very prominent, successful local businessman who was her brother-in-law. And he forbade her marriage to a poor pastor. Ella was ordered to end the relationship and end the courtship. So she wrote Henry a farewell letter, which contained the line, If we try, we may forget. Henry later incorporated this into the fourth verse of a poem, changing the name to Bella instead of Ella to hide her identity. Ella became Bella, and then when Joseph Webster set the poem to music, he needed a three-syllable name, so it became Lorena. And... Webster, Joseph Webster, after the war, also wrote the well-known hymn, In the Sweet By and By. So this is the story of Lorena. It was a very sad song. One Confederate officer said that men, when they heard this song, would lose their effectiveness from homesickness after hearing it and begin pining for wives and girlfriends they had left at home. Little wonder that Army commanders on both sides at different times during the war forbade their bands from playing Home Sweet Home or Lorena. Such was the power of music. Oh, 
pick it up just a little bit with this next song. As I told you when we started, minstrel songs were some of those popular songs of the day. Uh, we do one song that is just a lot of fun. It was a song written in the North. It's from a Northern perspective and Northern point of view, but it was such a fun song. It was sung all over the country, South and North during the war. The song was written in 1862. It's called Kingdom Coming or Jubilo. It was written by Mr. Henry C. Work. Like most minstrel songs of the day, it was written in dialect. And it was not politically correct. We're not going to be politically correct singing it. But this is a song that the men did. It was a song, if you listen closely, though, you will see that the one who comes out on the short end of the stick is the one being one made fun of in this song is the white plantation owner. The song was extremely popular. It was fun to sing because it was just plain funny. The words are, if you listen to the words, and they're going to be hard to hear a little bit, but we have copies of our songbook for sale afterward. You can pick those up. <laughs> you can go back and read how funny the words are. Uh, but it's extremely engaging. Listen as we tell the story of the Massa running off as the Yankee gunboats approached down the river and how the long-suffering folks left there on the plantation made sure that the good food and drink that got left behind did not go to waste. And this is like
Next will be on Jordan Stormy Banks. I'm ready for you. Um, as popular as a lot of the music, the, the secular music was at the time, what you heard a lot of the men singing in camp were songs that they had not heard all their lives. From the very earliest days, most of these men had been raised in church. So you heard them singing a lot of old, old hymns and tunes. And we'd like to do one for you that's one of our favorites. It's called On Jordan Stormy Banks or I'm Bound for the Promised Land, depending on which hymnal you pick up and which title you read. This was a tune and a song that was written by Samuel Stinnett in 1787 and was very well known throughout the country of Europe before and during the war. This was reportedly Jeb Stewart's favorite hymn. It said that uh, while he was dying and lay dying on his bet deathbed, he asked those men gathered around him to sing this tune for him as he, as he left for the other side, for the promised land. Another young Confederate officer, Sam Davis, was executed in Pulaski, Tennessee for spying in November of 1863. On the night before young Mr. Davis was executed, 21 years old, uh, Chaplain James Young visited with him and they shared scripture and prayed together. And as they closed their devotional and ended their time of sharing, they sang together this one song. Reverend, Reverend Davis said that he remembered for the remainder of his, of his life the animated voice of young Davis lifted in this beautiful tune and that was something that he always stuck with and always remembered. So we'd like to do for you, I'm Bound for the Promised Land. He will be doing a couple of solos in the middle of this. Hugh Glasgow. Sorry, let's start with the chorus. Let's start with the chorus, then we'll come in on the first verse. I'm bound for the promised land. We always get requested to do two particular songs, especially when our fiddle player is with us. We have a, a couple of modern tunes that were written after the war, but were written in tribute to the, to the memories of the men on both sides of this, this conflict who fought. Uh, one in particular for the South, and, and one was written in the North, but I think uh, symbolizes what a lot of people think of when they, they think of this period of our history now. And since Mr. Andy Borg, our fine fiddler, is with us today, we're going to ask him to, uh, to play a show and farewell for us. A beautiful tune. Uh, it was written by Mr. Jay Unger in 1982 and has become very popular. Probably you'll recognize it as the background for the Ken Burns series. Andy?
I saw a review of that song and said it was one of the most beautiful Irish tunes ever written. And then someone again right up, came in right below it and said, no, that was an American tune. It's probably one of the most quintessential American tunes of the 20th century. And Andy does a very beautiful version of it. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> one other modern song we get requests to do a lot was written, we think, probably in the 1920s or 30s. Uh, it's a song about a, a young man from Tennessee who goes off to fight in the war and leaves behind a young lady that he loves named Jenny. And probably knows he's never going to see Tennessee or Jenny again. And my good buddy, Mr. Danny Dean, who's been sitting here playing the guitar for us all day, brought us this song back many years ago. And, and people come around the fire that we don't even know at events and say, hey, can you all do Jenny for us? And uh, this is Danny's song. So we're going to let him start us off, and we're going to jump in there with him. So. Mama made my uniform Stripe on his shoulder. Papa wanted my color flag. Bring it back when it's over. I did a quick song in my day. Stop, stop, stop. Leaving Tennessee. Robert E. Lee. all around me. Good job. Come back in your songbooks to Dixie. Come back to Dixie. Find Dixie in your songbooks. Find it. This wouldn't be complete if we didn't sing Dixie. Uh, we almost left it out the time-wise, but we're going to go back and sing it. This is a song written by Mr. Daniel Decatur Emmett. And there's a lot of controversy whether he actually wrote it and where he wrote it. Some say it was here in Montgomery. Mr. Emmett himself says he wrote it while he was in an apartment house in New York City. Can't imagine that. New York City? 
Uh, whichever version of the book you believe, though, it was one of the most popular songs of the 1860s. It's been called the most distinctively American musical product of the 19th century. It became popular in minstrels, minstrel shows as a walkabout or dance song, and the audience joined in on the chorus as they learned it. It was played at the inauguration here in Montgomery of Jefferson Davis. Uh, with the outbreak of the war, the tune was too popular to leave alone. Both sides wrote war versions of this song. The northern version uh, had a lot, of ten- a lot of lines like, Oh, ye patriots to the battle, hear Fo- Fort Moultrie's cannon rattle. Then away, then away, then away to the front. Go and meet the southern traitors with the iron will. And should your courage falter, boys, remember Bunker Hill. Hurrah, the stars and stripes forever. Hurrah, our union shall not sever. Southern version is a little bit written by Abner Pike in uh, May of 1861. is a little bit different. Southerns hear your country call you less up, less that which is worse than death befall you. Hear the northern flunder, thunders mutter, northern flags and south winds flutter. Send them back with fierce defiance, stamped upon the cursed alliance. Thirty-nine versions of the song were written between 60 and 60, 66. In May of 1861, Confederate officer Henry Hotz said this, it's marvelous with what rapid-fire rapidity this tune Dixie has spread over the whole South. It now bids fair to become the musical symbol of a new nationality, and we shall be fortunate if it does not impose its very name on our country. We'll sing a couple of verses. Let's do the first and last verse of the Abner Pike version. You have that there in your books. And this is the war version of the Dixie, which Abner Pike called, make sure I get this right, the War Song of Dixie. We'll do, let's do a, do a chorus and then we'll jump in. Thank y'all. I catch my breath a little bit after that one. Uh, a little commercial. After y'all get done today, we're, we're going to play one more song and we're going to be done. But we have some CDs that are for sale. Uh, they're $15. They're more in quantity. They fit perfectly inside a Christmas stocking. So those <laughs> folks on your list that you know would enjoy something like this, and it's what you hear here. It's not a perfect set of music. It's with the mistakes, the things that the soldiers would have played. Uh, but... The money that we make as a profit to that, Bob referenced earlier the flag fund, and the, the money that we make as a profit from the sale of these CDs is coming back here to the archives for the preservation of the flags. So when you buy a CD, you're helping the archives as well, and you may be getting something nice for Christmas and maybe something your relatives won't throw away once they've listened to it once. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Christmas, you know, Christmas back during the 1860s, just like now, was a time of hope, a time of Thanksgiving, family, of gifts. And soldiers on both sides' thoughts turned toward home there at Christmas. Hearth, family, home. And through tradition, traditions have changed. We do things a little bit differently now, we're a little more commercial. But if you got dropped back into the 1850s or 60s, you'd recognize a lot of the things going on. Christmas trees were becoming popular. The royal family had one, everybody was copying. 
Uh, the Night Before Christmas poem came out in 1821 and helped to shape the vision of Santa Claus and what we know about him today. Families rich and poor, according to their means, gathered together for a Christmas dinner and exchanged small gifts. In 1836, Alabama became the first state in the Union to recognize Christmas as a legal holiday, something I didn't know until just a few days ago. But songs of the season were very popular. People got together to sing different things like the, the holly and the ivy, it came upon a midnight clear, O come all you faithful, good king once listened. One of the favorites is Silent Night. And before we sing and close our, our, our program today with Silent Night, we'd like to ask y'all to sing along with us on the first and last verse, if you would. Uh, so we'll close with something for the Christmas season. But I'd like for you to listen to, to one young man's words who wrote from Winter Camp in December, on December 24 of 1863, he wrote in his diary. And as you read this, don't think about just these folks who fought in this war. Think about the young men and women who are there for us today and the ones who have been there in every war that we fought and the debt of gratitude that we owe to them. And in your own way, if you want to, say a prayer for them or remember them in your thoughts as, as, and for what they do for us because they stand in harm's way and the blood that's been shed that allows us to come here in this freedom and do what we do is thankfully thankful to people like that. So remember them in this Christmas season and, and listen to the words of Thomas J. K., a young Confederate soldier, December 24, 1863. It is Christmas Eve. My thoughts carry me away to Helena where I might see my good wife before the hearth with three little children gathered round her, all listening attentively to their intelligent mother, relating to them, re, relating to them visit, the visits of Santa Claus. Having visited him, them before on former Christmas Eves with presents of toys, their curiosity is a height, at a height to know if he will come again and fill their stockings. Ah, but will not these young innocents be disappointed? Their father has not seen them for 20 months and is now far away battling for home and for liberty and has no means by which he can convey to them toys or money to purchase them. I pray heaven to provide my wife with the necessities of life and to bless and cheer the young and innocent hearts of my children during the Christmas holidays. Danny, you start us on Silent Night? Y'all want to stand? Let's stand and sing Silent Night. You can sit. Silent night, oh, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender. Thank you all for letting us share with you today. We appreciate the opportunity. We've been honored to come here. I understand there's a, a period of time where you can ask some questions. Uh, but the CDs will be over here, right over here afterward. So, uh, Sherry, if you, you why don't we all be seated and we'll sit down too and that way we can talk to each other a little bit. <laughs> it's ten till. We've hit it just perfect. Does anyone have any questions about the music? Yeah. Okay, let's get a microphone. Uh, they're going to insist on that one. So. We're just about
about out of time for oh, we are? questions. Okay. But we might have time for one more song. I have a request. Okay. <laughs> All right. Twist our arm, Bob. Okay. We'll do. Uh, if you have to leave, uh, it's, it's a good exit song. Yeah. And uh, Thank if, you, guys. if you want to, we're going to do Old Joe Clark. If you need a CD before you leave and we're still singing, uh, just see this gentleman right over here. Uh, John, they're right behind you on that table back there. And uh, let's do a couple of four verses and uh, lead us in, Jeffrey. Mr. Jeff Black, Black on the banjo, folks. Old Joe Clark, the preacher man, preached all over the land. Only text he ever knew, high low jack in a hand. Invited me for supper, stuck my toe on the table, legs stuck my nose in the butter. <laughs> Old Joe had a yaller cat, neither sing nor pray, stuck her head in the buttermilk jar and washed her sins away. <laughs> One calling frosty morn, old Joe up and died. The ladies come from miles around, Lordy, how they cried. Right out to Jeff. Right out to Jeff. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> we should do Alabama Gale. Well, we could do it. I, uh, I was looking at stuff for this program. I found 130-something verses to that song. Uh, one day we'll do all of them, but not today, I promise. Thank y'all. We'll be up here.